All right, so welcome back to The Young Idealist and to my uh, series on classical German philosophy and German idealism. I have a very special guest with me today, um, one who I've known for a bit of a while, actually. Um, I got to know their work because of my supervisor. Let me um, suggest that I read this text, um, a text that uh, Gabriel edited, actually. Um, for me to get to know uh, Gabe's work. So today we're, be, we're discussing um, Fichte's philosophy and I have Dr. Gabriel Gottlieb, who's an associate professor of philosophy at the Department of Z at Xavier University in the Department of Philosophy. His research interests include German idealism, work on Kant, Fichte, Schelling and Hegel, social and political philosophy and philosophy of action. He's the editor of Fichte's Foundations of Natural Right, Critical Guide through Cambridge University Press, and with James A. Clark, Practical Philosophy Between Kant and Hegel, Freedom, Right, Revolution um, through Cambridge University Press. He teaches courses on ethics, social and political philosophy, uh, and 19th century German philosophy. So welcome, Gabe. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So um, I have two series right now. I have one series on uh, the Jewish thinkers of classical German philosophy and post-Kantian thought. And I also have another one on classical German philosophy and German idealism. And you have been the most requested person to be on this series, actually. You and Fichte. I've received multiple requests to get Gabe Gottlieb on this series and to, have to discuss Fichte with you. So maybe we can begin by... Like, who is Fichte? Um, what's his significance in the history of German idealism? And um, why should we still read him today? If that's not too much. much. It's a lot, but yeah, let's start with who he is. Um, yeah, I mean, Fichte is a German philosopher uh, um, born in 1762. He dies in 1814. And it turns out he lives throughout an incredible age. Um, um, he's probably the most significant uh, philosopher writing in the immediate aftermath of Kant, um, often considered a post-Kantian. And in many ways, he's trying to develop a philosophical system, um, theoretical, moral, political, even a religious doctrine on sort of the um, um, we'll, we'll put it this way, within the wake of Kant's critical philosophy. Um, so he rises to stardom immediately, becomes um, an incredibly significant teacher and philosophical figure in Germany, a part of major debates that are taking place. Traditionally, he's been viewed as um, a kind of transitional figure between Kant and Hegel. Um, he per particularly exerted a significant influence on, on Hegel's philosophy on, um, in a number of ways. And, and if we want, we can talk about some of that. Um, he was so important to Hegel that when Hegel died, he had required that he be buried next to Fichte. So in the grave in Berlin, Fichte and Hegel and their wives are right next to each other. I think that's the final Aufhebung of Fichte's philosophy, perhaps in Hegel's eyes. Um, but um, along with Hegel, he exerted a significant, significant influence on Schelling. Um, but outside of German idealism, his influence has been quite wide um, in both good and bad ways. Uh, perhaps the bad ways are what he's best known for. Um, he wrote a work uh, called The Addresses to the German Nation, which is often seen as a kind of proto-nationalistic text um, 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 and had a significant influence on nationalism in Germany. Um, and he has, has his own theory of recognition, which in contemporary philosophy has gained some recognition and um, influenced some contemporary philosophers working on social and political thought. Um, so 
So that's really in a nutshell who Fichte is. I think perhaps what he's most famous for philosophically, though, is his conception of the I. The I is a kind of absolute self-positing subject. And an attempt to provide from the I a kind of theory of knowledge, uh, um, a, a moral philosophy, a political philosophy, all of which it seems is grounded in some way in the self-activity of, of the I. And in many ways that can look very Cartesian, very Kantian, but in other ways it really departs from that. And I think that that's probably the insight, the idea, the orientation um, that he takes that he's perhaps best known for. Um, so, so that's roughly who Fichte perhaps is. Um, I don't remember what else you asked me, but but that, so let me just stop there. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. That was a, a really nice, uh, lucid answer. I was wondering if you could maybe take us through his life, his biography, like if that's if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so he comes from humble origins. Um, his family was involved in uh, textiles. His father was a, a, a said to be a ribbon weaver, um, and he kind of accidentally became um, someone of note. Uh, when he was younger, and this is kind of a famous story about Fischer. Um, some people think it might be embellished, um, but but the famous story, nevertheless, is that he was well known for memorizing or or keeping track, more or less, of of the sermons that were given in his lo local uh, church, and. Uh, uh, a, a nobleman comes through his town, um, um, misses the Sunday sermon, wants to hear what it was about, and a pastor says, hey, you should talk to this Johann Gottlieb um, Fischer. He knows what's going on. And so Fischer, and he's, he's a young kid, um, uh, maybe nine years old, and he recites more or less verbatim the sermon for this nobleman, von Militz. And um, he's impressed. And with the support of his family and the pastor, uh, von Militz takes him under his wing and gets him a proper education. And, so, and he's supported by the von Militz family up until more or less he goes off to college. And eventually um, the support dries up. But he gets a great education and he goes to university. Um, and like many people, he's interested in theology. Um, but eventually he gets invested in philosophy. Like a lot of German, uh, in, um, um, educated Germans at the time who were interested in the academy, he spent time as a tutor um, in different cities throughout the region. Um, and as a tutor, he was asked by one of his students if if Fichte could tutor him on this new philosophy by Immanuel Kant. Um, and so, so he does, and he reads Kant's works. And he's particularly struck by Kant's um, practical philosophy and the second critique. And he has a kind of conversion experience where previously he had been drawn to a more deterministic philosophy, but under the influence of Kant, he sees that freedom or justification of freedom is really possible. So he converts, if you will, to a kind of Kantian standpoint. After a while, he decides to go visit the man himself, Kant, um, spend some time in Königsberg um, one summer, and basically runs out of money, realizes um, he needs some support, he offers, or he he asks Kant for some a loan, essentially, um, and Kant says, "Look, I can't do that." But Fichte leaves, comes back a few weeks later with a manuscript he's written on religion, um, and um, shows that to Kant. Kant's impressed, says he can write a letter to his publisher, and this book is a critique of all revelation, and so the manuscript goes to the publisher. Um, it's published, but his name is left off and it's published anonymously, which is not 
abnormal for the period, especially if you're writing about religion. But but that was not the intention. Um, so it gets published anonymously. It's reviewed um, by various folks and the journals at the time. And it's positively reviewed. And, and many people see this as Kant's religious new text on religion. Kant had not yet published his book, um, 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 Religion Within the Bounds of Reason. Um, so he'd not published that book yet. And, and so this is seen as Kant's work on religion. Reviewers even calling the author the sage of Kronensberg. And it turns out it's not. So Kant has to write um, an open letter saying, look, this is not by me. This is by this, uh, this guy Fischer. Um, um, and so immediately, I mean, it's a, it's a crazy mistake. It's a, you know, incredible luck on Fischer's part. Um, and so his star immediately rises. Um, and he's a, now, a, let's say, a public intellectual, we might say. He writes a book in defense of the French Revolution that's published in 1793. That's well received, but also criticized. It's seen as a kind of um, fairly radical view that he's putting forward. Um, um, it's also coming out at the time that the terror is happening and um, um, he's considered a, a Jacobin. But what happens is this guy Reinhold, important uh, theologian and philosopher who was te teaching at Jena. He was seen as really the great defender and developer of Kant's philosophy at the time, attempting to place the Kantian critical philosophy on the foundations of a first principle. Um, and Reinhold gets a job offer and um, Fichte is up for the job. Goethe in particular was an important influence. And so so Reinhold goes off to Leipzig and Fichte comes to Jena and he takes over Reinhold's chair. And at that point, he's really one of the most significant philosophers in Germany, but he doesn't yet have his own system. And he feels this pressure to develop uh, a, a, a systematic philosophy. And so he does that. He spends um, the year lecturing and, and he had even started doing this right before he got to Jena. He develops what's known as the Wissenschaftslehre, um, um, his own foundational philosophy. It's meant to correct mistakes that Reinhold's foundational philosophy made and to provide a true, let's say, secure foundation for the Kantian system. And the Wissenschaftslehre, this strange, complicated, let's say, German term, um, is difficult to translate into English. There's no, there's no one-to-one -one translation. Um, Wissenschaft is science, Wissen is knowledge or knowing, and um, Lehrer, doctrine. So sometimes it's translated as the science of knowledge, um, which is probably one of the best translations of it, but I prefer to leave it untranslated and just call it the Wissenschaftslehrer. Well, this Wissenschaftslehrer presents a foundational philosophy that posits a first principle. In fact, it's a couple foundational principles. Um, and then attempts to derive Kant's categories from these principles and to develop a theoretical philosophy that explains how we, how it's possible for us to have objective representations of the world. But the really interesting move that Fichte makes is he says, to do this, we can't just give an account of the objectivity of representations from a theoretical perspective, we have to ultimately turn to a practical perspective and develop a, a, the, the way in which our practical agency is a necessary condition for the objectivity of representations. And so this gets fished into talking about what he calls the striving of the eye. Um, so he does that. And while he's in Jena, he gives lectures, lectures on logic and metaphysics, lectures on natural right, on ethics. He develops a political philosophy and the foundations of natural right that's built upon the foundational philosophy, the Wissenschaftslehre. He develops a system of ethics that's built on um, the Wissenschaftslehre. And he's also becomes an important editor of some of the leading philosophical journals. While he's editing one of those journals, 
uh, essay is published about religion, and he decides that it's probably a good idea to write an accompanying essay that is almost a preface, if you will, to this first essay by a philosopher named Thorberg. And um, he does, and he, Fisher writes this essay about religion. Um, and in the essay, he identifies God with the moral world order, um, which is, at the time, sounds like atheism. Um, atheism in the sense that it's a kind of theism that is not easily situated within Christian theology. It's not saying there is no God, but it's saying God is identical with the moral world. But if you want to jump in at any time. So I let me pick up where I was, um, where I left off, which was this bit about um, Fichte and this essay he published in which he identifies God with the moral world order. And um, at the time, people think he's presenting a kind of atheism. Um, but I think it's complicated. Uh, it's not exactly the atheism of Marx, where it looks like he's just denying that there is a God. Um, it looks more like it's an atheism in the context of, um, of, of this Christ, of Christianity. So it's a theism that doesn't fit easily within a Judeo-Christian context. Um, if you identify God with the moral world order, um, it doesn't look like God is this kind of being that stands over and above, let's say, all that is. So, so he gets into some trouble um, and particularly one of the students, his parents, I mean, it's this kind of class, the way I, the, I was just talking about this in my class and um, a way I characterize it is Fichte gets canceled. Um, and one of the students is upset with uh, this, one of the student's parents is upset essentially with what Fichte has published and complains to the, to the authorities. Um, and he gets in trouble. And it turns out that Fichte just was not savvy in a certain way. Um, he wasn't apologetic. He was very defensive. Um, he was condescending. Um, and this became a significant controversy at the time where many of the major figures, intellectuals, theologians intervened, um, mostly against Fichte. Um, and the charge stuck. He was... Um, um, he eventually had to resign from the University of Jena, um, and he ended up moving to Berlin. And when he moved to Berlin, he's jobless. Um, so it's a sort of a meteoric rise and then just complete sort of uh, 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 drop, you know. And um, he ends up in Berlin, and he's got to survive, so he starts giving private lectures. Um, and he's still famous, he's still well known. So he gives private lectures and those lectures are attended by many of the leading figures in Berlin, philosophers, politicians, um, writers, and their families, their wives come, their children, not young children, but in some cases their grown children come. And, and it's something of a, of a scene there. And he gives various lectures and, th and that's what he does um, um, for the most part until he dies, he gives these public lectures. Um, he starts doing more public philosophy, what we would see as kind of like public philosophy, writing books for the public. Um, um, he writes about history, he writes about religion, um, he writes about um, um, nationalism, you might say, um, these addresses I mentioned to the German nation. Um, and, and, and he gives new lectures or new versions of his older philosophy, he gives new lectures on right and the state and on the Wissenschaftslehre. And all the while he's kind of revising his thoughts, particularly in response to debates that have been taking place since the initial publication of his works. Um, at the time, uh, Humboldt, with other figures in Berlin, founds the University of, of Berlin. Um, and Fichte gets hired to teach there. This is um, 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 1810, 1811, around then. 
He's eventually put in the position of rector for a bit. So he's the rector of the university. Um, and again, he's back on top, if you will. Um, this is all happening while the Napoleonic Wars are taking place. Um, and his wife at the time, um, they were both Fichte and his wife were um, adamantly opposed to Na Napoleon and, and, and his efforts throughout Europe. And so his wife is helping soldiers on the front um, and she gets sick and Fichte uh, um, 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 acquires that sickness and dies from it. His wife survives, but he dies in 1814. And at that point, that's really the end of his career. His son, though, who was named Emmanuel um, after the great Emmanuel Kant, um, became a philosopher in his own right. Um, but he does a lot of great work to collect Fichte's writings and puts out um, um, uh, the collected works of Fichte. And this happens in mid-century um, and that that actually is partly it's in virtue of those lectures that other works that were given as private lectures began to exert some influence on German philosophy in the um, really in the second half of the 19th century throughout the 20th century. So there's a massive amount of writings that just weren't available during Fichte's life that then became available afterwards and. Um, and his legacy continues to be developed in light of those, those, those works. Well, thank you for that very rich answer. That was fantastic. You took us right through um, Victor's life, which is wonderful. I was wondering um, if we could maybe discuss maybe the basic tenets or basic concepts of the Wissenschaftslehrer, if that's possible. I know that's a huge thing, but uh, just take us through yeah. some of the, the main concepts, I guess. Well, as I mentioned, I think the core concept is the idea of the I, um, which he characterizes differently as a self-positing I, as the pure I, as the absolute I. Um, um, and he, his goal, his goal initially is to provide a first principle of all philosophy, a first principle of, of science. And at this point, Fichte is really under the influence of Reinhold, who had kind of started this project. Let's find the first principle. And so Fichte takes that project up and runs with it. And so he posits a first principle that roughly says that the I posits itself absolutely, um, simply um, of its own activity. I mean, I'm paraphrasing the principle, um, but but the idea is that the I, through its own activity, pauses itself as itself. It can be hard to like figure out exactly what he's saying there, but let's just take it for granted for now. Um, and he then realizes that, well, if I'm going to posit the I as absolute, it seems that there's got to be something that is not I, right? So he posits a second principle, which is the principle of the not I, and he makes a clarifications here that the second principle is posited unconditionally with respect to its form, that is, um, but it's positive, it's materially conditioned insofar as it's conditioned by the I itself. Um, so the first principle is supposed to be absolute, unconditional with, with respect to form and content. The second principle is um, um, conditioned in one way, but absolute and unconditioned and another. Well, now Fichte has got this dilemma. It looks like he's got the I and the not I, um, and the not I, all the I is, is its own pure activity, um, but the not I seems opposed to it. How is it possible to have something that is purely active with another thing that is opposed to it and would seem to be negating the activity in some way? And so Fichte sets up a third principle which is meant to reconcile this tension between the I and the not I. And um, in that principle, he posits um, the concept of divisibility. In some way, the I has to be, he says, divided. In some way, the not I has to be divided. 
Again, it's not entirely clear what those concepts amount to, but the basic thought is that in some respect, the activity of the eye has to be limited in order to make way for the activity of the not eye and vice versa. And he considers this third principle, a grounding principle that really grounds the uh, two such that you can have them at the same time. And this is in part gives way to what Fichte calls the synthetic method, which is the name he gives to his methodological approach, which is known more broadly as a dialectical method. And in the synthetic method, you have the positing of a thesis an antithesis, so I, not I. And then in some way, there's a contradiction or tension between those two posits. So the goal from a philosophical, methodological standpoint is if the two are needed or required posits, we've got to find a way in which we can reconcile them. And so there's some synthesis that is performed that reconciles them. But I think there's something confused, there's something that often causes confusion, I think, for folks when you think about this dialectical method as thesis, antithesis, synthesis. It's really important, I think, to give, give um, to notice, I'll put it this way, to notice that when you're making a, a when, when the thesis is making its claim, if you will, um, there is a something that's being placed before you, a claim that's being made, you're positing something, that's sort of what thesis means to place, to posit. And then there's the antithesis, which is the positing against, the counterpositing, um, and it's anti, if you will, against the thesis. But synthesis doesn't mean in this context, bring the two together so we have one. It's not synthesis in that context. It's a thesis or two theses that are posited sin together. So what the synthesis does is it allows us to have both of those theses, the thesis and the antithesis, together at the same time. So we were we were talking about the last part, synthesis. Right. And so um so the so so we've got these two principles, the I and the not I, and Fichte needs to somehow reconcile them. Um, and so the third principle is meant to be a grounding principle that provides a synthesis. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna sort of wrap up the the Wissenschaft Lehrer now. Yeah, so what I was saying is that this foundational part of of the text where you've got the I not I in this attempt to synthesize the I and the not I, um, um, that's perhaps the most famous part of that work, um, the the first version of the Wissenschaftsler, which is um, um, called uh, um, um, the foundation of the entire Wissenschaftsler, and that's published in 1794-95. What he does after he gets the foundational account is he, as I noted, derives various categories um, gives an account of objective representation um, um, and then turns to practical considerations to try to show how practical agency is in some way necessary for cognition. And there he gives an account of the I as a striving activity, and that ultimately begins to lay the grounds for a kind of moral philosophy as well, though there is no worked out moral theory in the practical part, you do get an account of the drive of the eye, um, um, the striving of the eye, which for folks who know um, some Spinoza brings to mind some concepts in Spinoza. Um, and that work becomes sort of known as his really most important foundational uh, work in philosophy. And it's that work, the foundation of the entire Wissenschaftslehre, that is read by everybody, um, essentially at the time. The German Romantics were invested in it. Um, um, Schelling begins developing um, ideas out of it. Um, Hegel 
reads it and develops a critique of it. Um, and, and it becomes a kind of foundational text of German idealism. One might even say that it's the first like proper German idealist text where, where there's an attempt to construct a kind of a kind of system of the eye. And it's that concept of the eye that Fichte develops that gets radically transformed in, in the philosophies of, 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 of Schelling and Hegel. Um, so, so that's that Wissenschaftsler. Now he it develops and it changes over time, uh, but that's really the kind of um, foundational version of the Wissenschaftsler. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that. It, um, so my my next question for you is, I wanted to ask you how it develops over time, but I know you have a, an actual text um, coming out next year. Um, you're you're also you're an editor for a, a collected edition on the Wissenschaftler of the 1804. I was wondering if maybe we can just touch a little bit of it briefly because I know it's a massive text, if that's possible. Yeah, so um, so let me sort of fill in a gap between 1804 and 1794-95. Um, um, so immediately when he publishes his book, um, um, The Foundation of the Entire Wissenschaftsler, it's criticized um, left and right. And one of the criticisms is that, is, is really criticisms about foundationalism and about beginning with this first principle um, and attempting to derive all of science and knowledge from the first principle. So Fichte kind of gives up on that strategy a little bit. Um, um, and, um, um, and he gives lectures in which he tries to approach things a little bit differently methodologically. Um, but there's something important that happens, and that's the interventions of Schelling and Hegel. There's a break between Schelling and Fichte. So, so Fichte, massively influential, Schelling, young, upstart, uh, brilliant philosopher at an incredibly young age, starts turning out essays that look on the surface to be commentaries on Fichte's work. And even Fichte says to, in a letter to Reinhold, that these are commentaries, like Schelling's publishing good commentary on my work. What he doesn't realize is that Schelling's starting to develop his own way to think about the eye that has a much more metaphysical orientation to it than you see in Fichte. Um, Fichte's concept of the eye is not a metaphysical posit. He's positing the absolute eye for methodological reasons and it also serves a kind of normative role in his philosophy as a kind of posit that orients us in our striving, that as we strive to achieve or become the absolute I. And um, Schelling's early writings look to be positing the absolute I as some kind of being, and he connects it with being and even God and some of these early writings. Now, I don't think Fischer read these writings carefully, because if you read them carefully, it's quite clear that Schelling's doing his own thing on the back of Fischer. Um, so Schelling develops, and he there are moments in which he sounds very Fischian, and other moments in which he's like got his own creative contributions to add. Well, um, um, by the time we turn to the 19th century, there's a break between Schelling and Fischer, and that break is essentially about the role of first principles in philosophy. Fichte thinks that basically the first principle or foundational principles, however you want to characterize that, should provide the grounds for a philosophy of nature. Schelling thinks that that's a dead end and has a different approach. Um, so they break over this. At the time, Hegel is essentially a follower of Schelling's philosophy. Schelling begins to develop an identity philosophy um, um, that is 
posit some kind of being or 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 oneness indifference point he calls it at once that is beyond subject and object um and so hegel's like eating this up and he's on board and so he writes this version uh or he writes this book that is an attempt to differentiate Schelling's philosophy from uh, Fichte's philosophy. And in that book, he charges Fichte with being a subjective idealist. And it's, you know, there are different ways in which one might take that charge, but it looks like um, some version of um, what, what you might think of as a kind of um, um, I, uh, positing of, of everything within the subject, based in the subject. You might even think of it as in some way denying or negating the reality or objectivity of the world. And essentially the problem that Hegel and Schelling are pointing out is like, Fichte seems to be losing touch with the objective world, with objectivity. Um, and 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 this is also a kind of critique that some of the early readings of Kant's um, critique of pure reason had, um, accusing him of essentially being a Barclayan idealist. And Hegel and Schelling aren't the only ones. Jacobi has a similar critique of Fichte, uh, published in an open letter in 1799, where he actually accuses Fichte of being a nihilist for in some sense, annihilating the objectivity of the world. And with that, you get annihilation of lots of things like God, the annihilation of, of moral value. Um, and so, so Fisch is getting all these objections from, from left and right, and he wants to respond to them. And he starts responding to them in his private lectures that he's given. The most famous and perhaps influential of those is the 1804 lectures, which he gives in Berlin. And there are three series, it turns out, for a year, essentially, he's like lecturing and runs through his lecture series three times. The second series is the one that's been read the most and published and translated. Um, and it's translated in a, in a, in a, as, as a book in English by SUNY Press called The Science of Knowing. Um, Fichte's lectures on the 1804 Wissenschaftslehre. In this book, Fichte tries to provide what looks to be a more metaphysical account of the absolute I, but he characterizes it as absolute being. And so I think very clearly there's a shift that's taking place in which he's trying to revise or resituate the Wissenschaftslehre in less subjective oriented terms in a way that it looks more like a kind of objective idealism. And he proceeds to um, provide some kind of um, science of knowledge that resembles this previous philosophy. Um, but there are a couple of differences. The distinction between theoretical and practical reason is essentially collapsed by this point. He's not making a very, hard distinction between the two. He starts, or he grounds everything in being as absolute being. He begins from a different starting point. He begins with what he calls facticity, the givenness of the world. Um, and he attempts to show how the multiplicity or facticity of the world traces back to and can be grounded in absolute being. And then he moves from absolute being and through a, um, a different kind of methodological process of which he calls um, the genetic method or a genesis. He begins to construct what we would see as the Wissenschaftslehre to give an account of appearances, um, of representations, we might say. And, and the move there is from the ungrounded facticity of the given to absolute being where it receives its, if you will, authorization or justification to then a return back in some sense to facticity, but one in which it's been generated from absolute being and receives its um, um, justification. And we've given an account of 
the objectivity of of our representation and appearances, but now from absolute being rather than the subjective eye. That's the kind of move he's making there. It's this is like a super big overview of it because there's all kinds of new concepts he's introducing that are like light, um, 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 absolute being, facticity, um, the we, all uh, all kinds of new, it's just a new conceptual apparatus he's created. And so to figure out how it all fits together is the trick of interpretation. The big interpretive question people have about the 1804 Wissenschaftslehre and there are essays in the book that I that I have uh, coming out with my colleague Ben Crow. Is what is the relationship between the 1804 text and this earlier version of the Wissenschaftslehre? Has he completely departed from the initial uh, uh, project, or is this in some way continuous with that project? Just reoriented in terms of its conceptual framework and the way in which it's presented. Fichte says there are there is one Wissenschaftslehre, but an infinite ways in which it could be presented or many ways in which it could be presented. So that really raises this question, is he always talking about the same system, but offering different modes of presentation because one mode might be more accessible than another? Um, and that's a big and really interesting interpretive question. Um, I mean, if you're invested in these sorts of things, I think for many people, it's like, who cares? Let's just get, what is the Wissenschaftler? Just tell me that. I don't care about all of these different versions. Just So there, there, there may be perhaps different interests, um, but, but I find that a kind of interesting uh, question. What is the difference? Is it continuous or, or a really different project? No, that was that was fantastic. Um, I think you did a really great job of of elaborating all of these very wonderful themes. Um, and it's he's not finished with the Wissenschaftler after 1804. I mean, he continues in 1807, and he has lectures on on ethics. What where yeah, do you yeah. where do you think his philosophy continues after 1804? If that's a fair question to ask. Yeah, I think. Um, um, I mean, it, it's a it's a difficult question, and um, I won't pretend to have read all the versions of the Wissenschaftslehre. I think Günther Zoller has counted eighteen versions of it. Um, so, depending on how you divide things, um, you could probably even have more versions of it. Um, but but I think he's. I mean, I think there's one just practical thing going on here, which is like you start talking about your ideas at one point. And you you go one direction and then you revisit, rethink it. Years later, you present it, but it's a little bit different and it's oriented and dealing with a different set of problems. So I think there's something like really natural about that. Like um, we're getting these different versions that have tweaks and revisions. Um, and that's just kind of a natural process of, of doing philosophy. Um, um, but at the same time, there's this question about like, well, what is the goal of the system? Like, what are you trying to do? And if you are shifting, let's say the goal of the system, um, um, then it, it really does look to be quite different. The earlier project looks very much like an attempt to secure Kant's critical philosophy. But by the time you get to the 1804 Wissenschaftslehre, era, it's no longer obsessed, at least as I look at it, with trying to kind of provide this sort of systematic account of the critical philosophy. It kind of looks like it's doing its own thing and going off in its own direction. And so um, um, I think in some sense, Fichte has become, you know, invested in his own his own system for his own system's sake and is trying to get right what that system is. Where previously you might think that, yes, he's invested in building a system, but he's got this heavy weight on him, which is this Kantian background. Um, so, but there are all kinds of issues that come up. Like, for instance, when you look at Fish's political philosophy, there's one read of it in, a, in which 
the Foundations of Natural Right, which are published in 1796-97. It looks like, like a kind of liberal, um, a kind of left liberal Kantianism, you might say. It's grounded in right, um, which at the time was controversial. Like today, we take rights to be obvious, but there were many conservative um, uh, philosophers who were Kantians, also influenced by Burke, the um, um, English figure, um, political philosopher, political rhetorician. And um, Fisch is trying to justify rights in the face of these critiques that are coming from um, from the right. And it's an attempt to really, I mean, it really is an attempt to say, look, rights are necessary. And he derives rights from self-consciousness to the extent that he says that the concept of right is a necessary condition of individual self-consciousness. And then he develops a theory of property on the basis of that. But it's a theory of property that's not lock, not straightforwardly Lockean at all. It looks like the state is going to have to guarantee everyone the right to labor, which means they might also need to guarantee everyone the right to property, not just the, I should say, not just the right to property, but actual property. Because Fisch has this idea that you're only free if you're able to exercise your agency in the sensible world. And that is something that would need to be guaranteed if the state is in the job of guaranteeing the individual's freedom. So it looks like he gives in 1796, 1797, a kind of really liberal account of, and left liberal account of, of right. But then he defends uh, in the closed commercial state, a kind of proto-socialist um, uh, political economy in which the, the, the way in which you think about rights and laws within a state is it's juridically closed. So like, although Canada and the US might have a lot in common, we have US laws and Canada has Canadian laws and we're juridically closed. Well, Fichte defends a economically closed state um, in which there's planned economy, um, what looks to be a fiat currency, and lots of guarantees that the state is providing with respect to property. Um, um, and it looks to be a kind of proto-socialist state. Um, and then he ends up in the addresses to the German nation defending what looks to be a kind of proto-nationalism. Um, and I would say it's really not nationalism in the way we tend to think about it, but a kind of German exceptionalism there is no nation state in Germany at the time. Um, um, and he's more invested in um, a kind of unity, a kind of cultural and educational unity amongst the people. Um, um, it's later in the 19th century that this gets tied to debates about the unification of German German lands. And, um, um, but, but, it, but it still is, not well it doesn't look liberal let's put it that way um and so there's this question like what's going on like he looks to be this early liberal philosopher but then you get these anti-liberal conceptions of of political economy and the state and then you get this proto-german exceptionalist nationalist tendency developing what's happening at the time um and so that's another kind of development in which there's these major shifts taking place. From a scholarly perspective, that's really fun because you've got to make sense of it and try to figure out what's going on. And um, but from let's say the impact it might have had on the world, you know, I, I, I think it's undeniable that Fichte's addresses to the German nation um, were used to justify uh, German nationalism, which um, turned out awful. Um, um, and so, so there are complicated issues there. Um, um, and we can talk more about that. Um, um, but there's these interesting shifts that are taking place. Now, when I look at the philosophical shifts, like the ones I mentioned about the changes from the early Wissenschaftsler to the 1804, it looks like he's largely responding to philosophical objections. 
when I look at these political changes, it looks like he's responding to not philosophical political objections to his philosophy, but massive changes that are taking place throughout Europe. And many of those are the results of um, and effects of the French Revolution and ultimately Napoleon's rise to power. And he publishes the addresses to the German nation in, in 1808, I think. He gives the lectures in 1807. But it's in 1806 that essentially Napoleon conquers German lands um, and they're, the Battle of Jena and Austerlitz are major battles that Napoleon wins. And Germany is, much of it is an occupy, is occupied by the French. And so what's interesting about the addresses to the German nation is the, the nationalism, the, the opponent to the Germans are the French. So it's this anti-French sentiment, um, an anti-Napoleon sentiment that is motivating this sort of move towards a kind of um, proto-nationalist German exceptionalist standpoint that starts, makes you question his commitment to a more left liberal Kantian project. Um, there's all, I could say a lot more about the addresses, but, um, um, but, but, but I think that's an interesting shift that's taking place. No, I think you did a, I, I, I'm learning so much about the addresses at the time. I remember reading your paper on the addresses, actually, you had posted. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to take too much of your time. I don't know how we're doing on time on your end. Um, but maybe I guess um, we can sort of wrap it up, I guess. Um, that way I, I don't, I'm not bombarding you with so many questions. I was just wondering how you got in, in interested in Fichte and Fichte's philosophy. I always find this interesting to find out where yeah. where a thinker is, where you actually learn about a thinker, where how you get interested in in Fichte's philosophy. Yeah, uh, well, I don't think too many undergraduates get interested in Fichte and go to graduate school to study Fichte. I hope that changes. Like, I hope the generation of scholars that I'm a part of and and you're a part of will bring about those changes. Um, for folks like Fichte and Schelling, um, but but I think it's Hegel, right? Um, it's Hegel who is the figure often that capture people's imagination, and, and um, or it's Marx or it's something like that. And you kind of there's a sort of standard story. It's like you're interested in maybe the Frankfurt School or Marx or Hegel, and you're like, I need to go back to Kant, and then you try to work your way up. Um, well, for me, that was the case. I was invested in um, two things, two figures. One was Marx and one was um, a kind of post-Marxist um, named Cornelius Custoriadis. And Custoriadis is a relatively obscure Greek-French philosopher who, um, again, had a significant role in French intellectual life in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, 70s even, but it's relatively obscure. And um, 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 But I wrote an undergraduate thesis about his philosophy, and he was really invested in the imagination and this concept he calls the radical imagination. It's got some Freudian lineages to it. Um, and I got really interested in like theories of the imagination when I was an undergrad and, and um, I um, went to graduate school and did my PhD at the new school, partly because it was like one of the only places where there were folks who were interested in Custoriadis's work. And um, I was um, really wanted to follow up on this tradition of the imagination. And Custoriadis like had this thought, which is like, there, and it, it's got a kind of Heideggerian pattern to it. There are the imagination has not been properly thought. There are certain figures, Aristotle and Kant and um, post-Kantians who opened up the possibility for really thinking about the radical nature of the imagination, not just as a kind of imitative faculty, but as a truly creative faculty. And um, 
So I was like, okay, that's cool. Like that could be a project I work on. And um, so I tried to kind of think through that a little bit. And that motivated me to um, um, go back and read Kant and think about Kant from that perspective. And um, I was interested in the German romantics. So I started reading the romantics and I was interested in Fichte because that seemed like Fichte is like often identified as having a really innovative conception of the imagination. I haven't really said much about that, but but his theory of cognition depends on um, this conception of the imagination oscillating back and forth between I and not I and being productive and creative and producing representations. And so I started working on the romantics and, and as it turned out, there was a book translated by Novalis right when I was ready to write a master's thesis, which was Novalis's Fichte Studien, the Fichte studies, just been translated. And I was like, this is the perfect book. It's gonna help me think through these things and I'll write a master's thesis on Novalis, which I did. It was a horrible idea because not only did I have to try to figure out what Novalis was up to, he's writing about Fichte, but it's all notes. It's all just notes to himself. And so I'm trying to figure out what Fichte thinks, what Novalis thinks, what his critique of Fichte is. And, and it was kind of a mess, but that was really the thing that ignited my interest in Fichte. Um, and because I had this all other interest in kind of the Marxian tradition and Hegel, eventually I realized it's probably when it comes to a dissertation, I, I need to focus, right? And so I thought I'll write about his foundations of natural right and try to work out really what's going on in that book from a kind of recognitive and um, intersubjective standpoint. And um, there had been some work on that. So it was like, you could sink your teeth into it a little bit more than some of other Fichte's writings. And um, so I wrote my dissertation about that. And, you know, when I finished up, it still was the case that there was just not a ton of work on Fichte and work that I thought was super useful. Um, and so I kind of was like, look, there's a lot of work to be done here. And I, I think like when you look at someone like Hegel and when you look at someone like Kant, there are debates that go back 50, 60 years in the literature and they're really entrenched. They're really narrow in lots of ways. Um, and I love that stuff. Like I eat that scholarship up. I love it. But I felt like there wasn't as much for me to add in, in that way and, and working on an underrepresented under sort of theorized, under um, um, researched figure, at least in the Anglo-American tradition, was really attractive um, and um, lots of possibility. And so I just kind of dug into that and I've been doing that since. And at times I'm like, I need to get out. I need to like escape the grip of Fisher and um, do something else. But, you know, it's like, you just get pulled back in and there's so much to do. And it's it really is probably the one of the most exciting times to be working on Fichte because there's more translations, more coming out. There's lots of great German scholarship, but in the Anglo-American tradition, there's just tons of possibilities. And so so I'm seems like I'm committed to doing that for a while. Yeah, no, it seems like there's a kind of renaissance of, of Fichte's work and Fichte's philosophy. That is, this is why I wanted to do this video, because there's not a lot on um, on the social media and on, especially on YouTube, where you can watch videos on Fichte. So this has been really, yeah. really enlightening and really, really well um, organized. I think I think you were really super, super coherent and brought Fichte to life and we can all hear the passion that you have for Fichte's philosophy as you speak about it. So I want to thank you so much for for being here today, Gabe, and walking us through his life and his philosophy. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, definitely happy to do it. Thanks for having me. It was fun. No, it really was fun. It was always great to talk to you. All right. See you later. Okay. Yeah. All right.
So uh, again, technical difficulties. Here it is. This is this is the onstos of our discussion. That's what it is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I let me pick up where I was, um, where I left off, which was this bit about um, Fichte and this essay he published in which he identifies God with the moral world order. And um, at the time, people think he's presenting a kind of 